Um, and also to the audience in the room. Um, I first met Murray, she's it, probably 25 years ago when uh, we both had small children um, and Murray was living in Waitati in a house that had a boat, I seem to remember, attached to the front porch. Oh, kind of creative. But uh, Murray's gone on to do lots of interesting things with his life, um, including, I suppose, living in a way that that creates the kind of resilience we're looking for the future of, of everybody. So Murray's tried to, to walk the talk, is what I'm trying to say. And he's also continued to think and talk very deeply about what it means to live in a future where humanity is already living beyond the limits of what the earth can produce. And um, he's sometimes provocative and always um, articulate. And I'm really looking forward to his talk today. So good, everybody. Um, I'm just going to um, do a little bit of camera because I need it to be in there. Yes, right. Oh, if that's all right. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Great. So I'll hand it over to you. Um, and um, by the way, this is also um, being recorded. Um, so it, it's going to be available to um, online for anybody who wants to listen afterwards. So kia ora. Right. Thank you. Um, this is an overall topic. It's not a silo topic. And to be honest, it needs for more than 50 minutes. It needs an afternoon, a jam session, a conference. So I'll be going fast, light, and fast. Um, there are too many slides, so please be happy to um, grab the PowerPoint afterwards and go through them slower. And I'm happy to talk slower with anybody for as long as it takes. This is the first leader of a G7 country to ever acknowledge that we may be actually running up against the limits to growth on the planet. Brave because politically it's pretty much suicide to acknowledge that. This is the coverage from the New Zealand media of that statement. And my question to the New Zealand media is, is that, is that actually telling us the truth? It's an open question. My approach to it comes from Mr. Plastic Petrol Head over there, apple in my eye, we've got three wee grandies, he's the oldest. As you can see, his whole life, is dependent on this thing over here. I rate his chances of getting to my age at my standard of comfort as zero. I reckon his chances of getting to my age full stop. On a good day, I reckon it's three and eight, and I reckon on a bad day, one and eight. And that's because I reckon that we will be carrying it when his, when he gets to my age, we'll be carrying somewhere between one and three human, billion humans on the planet. We're carrying eight now. The left hand side has been a lifelong love of mine studying energy, working with energy, being efficient with energy. This is the wellhead known as F7 Maji Sullivan. Um, that uh, was in then in Persia, now you call it Iran. So bountifully did that little piece of pipe give between 1911 and 1926, seven million tonnes of oil came up that pipe. They were so impressed, they put that little plaque there, thanking it, and it was customary for the BP types in those days to doff their caps as they went past, thanking it for its profit giving. Being Iran, I doubt the plaques there, and I doubt they doff their caps nowadays. The poignant part about it is it's a finite resource. It's the finite resource that produced that kind of lifestyle, and it was capped. That one was capped in 26. So... Let's go back and see if we can find some truths. Way back and opening up wide and getting simple. This is from Nicholas Jujewski Rojan, who mentored him and Daly, who's now in the rest home. So this is a pretty old slide. This is everything. This is the all of it. This slide tells us that climate change concerns are real, that we can heat or cool this circle by upping or lowering what goes out on the bottom right. This tells us that inside our box, which is where we do all our living, money isn't actually a store of wealth. Money is obviously a proxy, where we go to the left-hand side of the box and ask for a portion of those two arrows, the energy and the materials, or what we'd call resources. So child poverty then, 
we can tell there's not child lack of access to money. It's actually child lack of access to the two arrows on the left, right? And so we can make ourselves feel good about child poverty by giving them more money, but as long as they've got a dollar less than us, we'll outbid them the left-hand side of that box. The big point about this one, this graph, and you've got to remember this one, is that there was a store of the solar energy in between the outer arrow and the incoming box arrow. It was stored underground before we evolved. Millions of years of solar acreage stored underground. When we started going in that little box there, we started tapping backwards along the arrow that comes in from the left, the energy one. If you're a gatherer, you can tap back one year of solar sunlit acreages, right? One growing year. If you're a hunter, you can tap back several the life of an animal. If you're, if when you worked out how to handle fire and cook food and therefore take some of the digestion energy required away from your food energy, you've actually tapped into trees, which is now you're going back some decades along that arrow. And essentially that's what we did. We were clever enough to learn how to eat wood. Um, what the big mistake we made was to tap right back into the millions of years of solar acreage that were buried out of our biosphere underground. What we're doing is trying to leave up that energy to live extravagantly active lifestyles. And we're trying to then offset the burning of that energy, which we're pulling into this biosphere by sequestering in this biosphere and there isn't the acreage to do it. So we're having land competition issues and we're not dealing with that, discussing that. Also, of course, material wise, you need to get really close to 100% recycling or you're going to run out of the arrow at the bottom. There's probably other things I could say about that one, but we'll travel on. This is how economists working inside that box blindly see it and how they teach it. There are no inputs and no outputs. Okay. Thus, sitting over there in that tower with the funny atrium, they can tell you that. Energy is 5% or 3% or 10% or whatever of an economy. Actually, without the arrows going in, this doesn't happen at all. Energy is 100% underwrite of the economy. Thinking, if we're going where I think we're going, we're going to need to be thinking logically, straight and clearly. This is my old man, he was born one year before that well head was capped in Maji Suleiman. Um, I'll take you back to 1965, I'm 10 years old and I'm having a fit. I want to build a balsa glider, but it's Saturday and it's New Zealand and it's 1965 and there are no shops open and we probably couldn't afford balsa in our budget anyway. So I'm having a 10 year old meltdown. He waits till I subsided and he gives me the best lesson of my life. He says, if you're having a problem like that, he said, turn it in the around in your head and turn it inside out, upside down and back to front. And he walked away. And the thing I built was built, it was blanket stitched together with cardboard. The wings were pieces of Venetian blind. It wasn't pretty, but I was 10. And I've never forgotten the lesson. Years later, I'd learn about De Bono and his hats and all the rest of it. I still think it's the simplest and clearest way to explain to people. If you say to people, um, think outside the square, they don't know where to start. If you tell them to turn a problem like, like with a Rubik's Cube, inside out, back to front and upside down, they've got somewhere to go. The bike he's sitting on as a result of one such conversation, I turned up at his place on my push bike. I said, isn't it a pity that your crankshaft starts at the top with or your pedal starts at the top and there's no power going in. Halfway down, you're full power, bottom back to no power. Isn't it a pity? And he said, what can we do about that? I won't waste time here. Come and see me afterwards if you're interested. The pedals on that thing do 230 degrees of rotation applying power. It's the weirdest thing to ride because you're pedaling on, you're pushing the second pedal before the first one's finished. All he did was turn the thing inside out, upside down and back to front. And the lesson from that is that there are billions of people on this planet who accept 180 degree power strokes. Not very many thought their way outside it. 
When I was young, I used to think he was a genius. I don't now. I understand that he just knows how to think logically, inside out, upside down, back to front, or new. So, move on. I'm 28 years old now. Got a partner. We've got a house in Waitati, as you mentioned. And we're looking at adding to it frugally because we're on the bones of our backsides. So I'm sitting there with a mate who's, an old, who's a post office technician and thinks somewhat similarly. And we decide to design the minimalist house. So we figure you need at least one compression strut in a structure, right? So that's like an umbrella or a rotary clothesline line or a merry go round or the sky tower. One you need. Usually it's placed in the middle because that reduces the amount of cantilever out the side that you're hanging off it. So we think about a column up the middle of a house and we figure we could put all the services in it. We could put the power in it and the water in it and the log burner and the flue and the spiral staircase around it to the mezzanine and you could build it on the ground or in a factory, bring it along and tip it up and it would be all the services for the house. The outside walls wouldn't need anything in them. And then we thought, well, the studs now, because they'll be in tension hanging off it, they don't need to be forward toes, they could be plywood. Hey, they didn't need to be plywood, they could be wires. Hey, we don't need them at all. We could just be the stressed steel skin hanging there. We had a few jokes about how you'd possibly worry about it blowing around in the wind. I didn't think about earthquakes. And, <laughs> and that you'd possibly need rubber service connections like rubber sewer hoses, you know. Big joke. End of the story. 30 years later, I'm reading the transcript of a lecture given in 1968 by an eccentric fellow called Buckminster Fuller. So I Google them as you do, Google images as you do. Bingo. That's our house. Exactly. We were 40 years ago. He's 50 years before that on the other side of the planet. He's regarded as an eccentric genius. I don't believe that. I think he just knew how to think. <laughs> and he came down exactly the same thought process that we did. And it's important for people to understand that this, anybody can do this. If you clear away the chaff and do this, do, 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 you get there. One of my favorite ladies, I live with my favorite lady and the other most favorite lady has been dead for 20 years, but she rates fairly highly. This is Eva Hakansen. She set out in 2007 to make electric vehicles sexy. It was a fair effort. Um, so she decided to run at Bonneville. That thing's a sidecar. She's up over 400 Ks. She's gunning for 600 Ks. Um, she designs 80% of it herself, builds 80% of it herself. All the welding is hers. She's got a PhD in metallurgy and in many other degrees. Um, and she's pretty awesome, right? But she's got a problem. At speed, her tyres, like everybody else who's turned up at Bonneville with rubber tyres, expand. And you remember the Burt Monroe movie where um, the rubber came off his forks and started getting on his goggles, right? Nobody's really solved it. And she's nudging up into the speeds where it's a problem. The faster vehicles tend to be thrust vehicles, so they're rockets or jets, and they just push themselves along, and they roll on hard aluminium disc wheels. And all those wheels have to do is roll. They don't have to impart thrust into the sole. Okay? So Eva does what 50 years of people at Bonneville hadn't thought to do. She turns it inside out, upside down, and back to front. My old man and her would have got on like a house on fire. So she takes the aluminium wheel, which does work at speed, she 3D prints a whole lot of football studs and rubber with lugs on the inside and pull through loops on the outside. She pulls them through the holes, cuts off the loops, and she's just applied thrust or released friction ability to a wheel that isn't going to expand. It's beautiful engineering. Genius? No, clear thinking. Okay, one of my heroes. Um, thinking sequences when you're evolving, they tend to be Evolutions to a point, and there's a jump point, there's a, a, a lever point, and then there's evolutions away from that. Um, hang gliding, Jenny's partner, Guy, and I will tell you that the lever point for hang gliders was between 1979 and 1981, where they went from single surface with no battens to all of a sudden battens and then double surface battens. Right? The evolution was in a very short part. So here's us 
the family with the downhill trolley stuff. Started with four wheels sitting up. Three wheels sitting up, I dragged the fourth one down the road. Lightened the wheels, bit of a fairing. You should have seen the parents' faces the first time that one did a run. And we have finally ended up with this. And the first time I showed this one to the old man, I said, sorry, Dad, I only got two out of three. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, see, you see the bodywork, there's a little catamaran hull, it's upside down, and that's the keel on top and the bow at the back, mm -hmm. right? So I said, I managed to get it upside down and back to front, I'm damned if I get it inside out. <laughs> the point about this sequence is that that and this are the same thing, more or less. That and that are the same thing, more or less. The flip point is between those two, right? That's the maximum leverage of the change. And every, often it's in hindsight you see it, but every evolution of thinking will have that point. And it's, if you can identify it and put your effort into it, you're doing better than wasting it on the either side of it. Right. Um, there's an old Arab phrase that goes, um, because I was a thirst, I've dug a well so that others may drink. And I guess I've lived a life like that. And I don't know why, don't ask me why, but I just felt like somebody might as well do it. It might as well be muggins. So we've gone ahead. We know there's going to be an energy deficit in the future. We're trying to prove that you can live on not much energy. This is our 2005 build of a passive solar house, and we're trying to run it, and did run it for some years, on 50 watts of solar panel. Now, 50 watts is three-fifths of sod all, and we're still only running on 300, which is still three-fifths of sod all. So, yes, we're as efficient as we can be with the 50-watt panel. We have it counterweighted, um, shock absorbed, rotating, and tilting. So it's doing everything. Um, I think we've got somebody at the door, Janet. Um, so our problem, oh no, sorry. Our problem is that we're trying to run a fridge. We decided we won't run the freezer, we're trying to run a fridge. And on 50 watts, that's a big ask. Now most fridges sit in 20 degree kitchens and they're trying to be four degrees inside. You open the doors, four degree air pours out and down and across the kitchen floor. You close the doors and two thermostats kick in. One's trying to turn the 20 degree air that's now entered the fridge back down to four degree air. The other one's your heat pump that goes, oh, somebody's thrown four degree air across my floor and it tries to turn it into 20 degree air. It was an indulgence we could afford while we had surplus energy in the system. It is not an indulgence I think we can afford ahead. So what's the answer? Well, top loading fridges don't lose cold air. So our decision was to use a dead freezer and apply a 12 volt compressor to it. Next question, where do you put it? In the 20 degree kitchen and constantly put a 50 watt panel and ask it to do the 16 degree split between 20 and four? No. So where's the coldest place? Inside out, outside the house. Where's the coldest place outside the house? Obviously the south side of the house. And in winter in Dunedin, a fridge is probably not going to have to work for most of the time and, and every night, right? Through winter, it'll be four degrees. Okay, now we've got a top loading freezer outside the south side of the house. This is all a given. How do you access it? And this one took me a couple of hours. I mucked around thinking about vestibules and two sets of back doors and da da da. And finally, the penny dropped. Take the house outside. So, what we did was we took a box like a bay window outside, just over the lid of the freezer, leaving the body of the freezer outside exposed. Yeah. So, there's the lid inside. This is 15 years later now, well hacked. The sun is on the back wall of the house, just down here. And there you go. And we're running on 50 watts. Right? Inside out twice applied to that problem. Right, growth. Most of you know all this, especially in terms of doubling time. 3% growth doubles in 24 years. 10% in seven of the ones I can remember because 10% growth um, doubles in seven years and 7% doubles in 10 years. 
20 doublings, you're doing a million times what you were doing in the first instance in the same time frame. It doesn't have long to go when the hockey stick approaches vertical. And when applied to material terms, this is in the term sustainable growth is an oxymoron. Anybody who says that as a phrase, challenge them. One of the first people to pick this up, and again, an original thinker, much maligned, most people say, oh, he was proven wrong. Um, no, he was a product of his times, but he was a thinker. This is what he said. Essentially that, yes, you can probably hybridize wheat and grow it taller than it is now, but it's never going to get to say five minutes tall, right? Fair enough. There's the kicker. In all cases, therefore, a distinction should be made between an unlimited progress and a progress where it's merely, the limit is merely undefined. And this is the crux of our problem now. I use this slide to teach people about growth. I don't need to do that here, I suspect, but I'll run through it quickly. So I tell people to imagine they've got a pile of something dropped in their driveway. I tell them that every night they come home and they shovel a bit of it away. First night, one shovel, second night, two, four, eight, 16. So we're doubling. This is the growth thing, right? I tell them I don't need to know the size of the pile, their pile or the size of their shovel to tell them what happened in the last three nights. The last night they went from all finished or far finished to all finished, the blue hats. The night before that, they went from a quarter to a half. The night before that, eighths to a quarter, right? This is just doubling. I don't need to know any of their figures to know that. When they were at the asterisk point, it might have been 100 nights that they've taken to get there and they think they've got forever. They've got three doublings. And in fact, the last one technically isn't a doubling because your supply is reducing. If that's a resource like oil, you, you can't actually keep growing. You can force the issue and keep your growth trap going. And that's the dotted line on the left-hand side. But of course, the area that's appearing between the graph and the dotted line has to come from somewhere. Logically, it's coming from the right-hand side, isn't it? Where you finish. And so that drop-off graph gets steeper and steeper as per the dotted line, and eventually it becomes vertical. There's a guy called Hugo Bardi who's coined the phrase Seneca event or Seneca cliff um, to describe this verticality. Um, uh, it's named after an old Roman senator who noticed that the way upwards could be slow and the way down could be quite rapid. Um, well, we've got a slide that's not appearing there. Uh, there is a book, and this slide should have appeared, um, from Donella Meadows, who's one of the, um, actually we've got two missing here, have we? Oh no, there we go. That's Donella up on the top right. Um, she's lead author of the Limits to Growth book, which came out in 1972-ish. Um, there is a better book, and if you ever want to read something about this, this uh, about systems, um, her book is called Thinking in Systems, a Primer. It's a cracker. Uh, that slide is the spaghetti and meatballs complex version. I had a simple slide that doesn't seem to be appearing. This is what they came up with in 72, having applied systems to the planet. This is a version done by Graham Turner in 2014. It's since been um, peer reviewed again by Gaia Harrington, who's a um, director at KPMG, no less, and she did her master's at Harvard, mentored by Turner, and we're still essentially tracking the standard run, which this is. Um, very quickly, the colored bands you'll see, the right hand side of it is the year 2000. The black lollipop, which I somewhat disagree with, I think financial collapse is a matter of belief and it could happen tomorrow. The black lollipop indicates 2030. So now we know that between the right hand side of the colored band and the black lollipop, we are two thirds of the way across that space. Have a look at the three dotted line inflections that happen now. They are food per capita, services per capita, and industrial output per capita, right? All three, they all inflect quite seriously now. This is what we euphemistically are calling supply chain issues. 
and they're not going away. And this is why we're starting to fight in Ukraine, and this is why Europe's in trouble this winter. We need to be realistic about what is actually happening and not worry about personalities. Notice out of interest that population and um, pollution, obviously for obvious reasons, lag those three inflections. They ran various scenarios because they, they surprised themselves when they did the standard run. This is double initial resources. Um, I won't spend too much time on these. Um, I think James Cameron knew about this. I think that's what Avatar's about. And I think uh, you know, with his own titanium and his second planet and his ripping the resources from under other people, I'm sure Cameron absolutely knew all of this. That's why he wanted to live in New Zealand. So, and there's others, the reference from two-child policy. So it goes. One-child policy, what China did or attempted to do was belittled by the Western media. It's probably one of the more poignant correct moves by a government on the planet ever. This, so this is the resources that you can see doing the dive from top left on this graph across this period now. Sorry. This was done in 2012 for the BBC. Um, the wee icon over there is 2030, so I took the liberty of putting the dotted line in about where we are. Notice the amount of colour missing since 2012 in 10-year period. Notice the amount remaining, and if that doesn't worry you, nothing does. All right? Even if it's out by a factor of two, that should scare them out of you. Key resources energy, of course because with energy, you can do anything, including 100% recycling without it, you're, sh you're shot. Steve King, I've got a lot of time for Steve King. This was his description when he was hammering other economists about the importance of energy. All the, re all the renewables we've built in the last decade or two have not reduced our use of fossil energy. We have added them to the use of fossil energy. That percentage has not changed. When I first gave this slide about 10 years ago. Marion King Hubbard was another person who saw it coming. I'll quickly screwed over this. Um, these were his comments back in about 1956, and nobody listened. He came up with now, this is what I base my pile of stuff in somebody's driveway and the exponential growth digging into it with the shovel thing on. So this was his original thing on oil. Um, Right. This one, one of the bigger lies that we've had told to us is from the IEA who um, advise all governments about energy. So this is discoveries of oil. Um, the blue is what we know. The yellow is what we expect. Pretty obvious. Under the black is what we're using. Um, and you'll notice that, or, or you realise that under the black, when it equals the blue plus the yellow, then it's all over. So look at that yellow and look at the taper, which is what you'd expect. Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Oh, just one second, that's easy to solve. Click over. There we go. Yep. Lovely. That's right. All right. This is what the IEA gave us by way of explaining that. This third colour down is the um, fields yet to be found, which is exactly what the yellow was in the previous slide. Okay? The yellow tapers to the right, the blue expands to the right. It's an attempt to keep their colour going high at the top, and they've buried it halfway down their graph. It's a lie. <laughs> Any return, return on energy invested, EROEI, an important ratio, probably everybody here knows it. The usual way to explain it is a wolf chasing a rabbit. If the eating of the rabbit gives less energy than the chase took, the wolf dies. Okay? It's just a ratio, and all life has to be on the positive side of that ratio. Doesn't matter whether he's rich, and it's why we haven't found top end predators. You can't farm lions that takes too many antelopes to be corralled and fed to them to, 
to give you a return on the, on the energy that you get back out of eating the lion. So we've never done it. We can hunt them and let them do the hunting on their own. We can't farm them. The ROEI is a ratio we're going to be seeing more and more of. By type, anything under about eight, we can argue about where it is um, in ratio, but about eight, below that, you can't keep business as usual going socially. Um, the difference in opinion about where the threshold is, some people say 15 to one is the bottom threshold, some people say five. It's to do with how long ahead you look at maintaining your infrastructure because infrastructure decays at an increasing rate. Net entity cliffs, so EROEI falls off a cliff, reverse exponentially, right? It's just a J curve going backwards. We're somewhere there at the moment falling off the cliff. And this is another way of looking at it. Essentially, it takes more and more work to stay where you are. And this is why prices for things like solar panels aren't going to keep going down to a zero price point. They're starting to climb again. Ivan Rick over picked it up very early. He said um, in 1957 that renewables will produce about 7 to 15% of what we're expecting to run on. In other words, take fossil fuels out, we're down to 7 or 15% of what we're doing. Energy options, you folk all know these. I've left hydrogen out because out of hydrogen is not an energy source. Everybody knows that. Yeah, no more than sulfuric acid is in a battery. They're merely storage vectors. Efficiencies, one part of productivity gains. So economists will tell you that somehow we've tailed off in labour productivity. Actually, what we've done is run up against the energy efficiency limits, which are second law of thermodynamics and Carno. We've run up against those limits. It's not the digger driver that can be more productive, it's the digger. By several orders of magnitude, fossil fuels outgun us completely. And so we're running up against those sort of thermodynamic limits, and thus where productivity is tailing off. You can only approach 100%, again, thermodynamics, in practice won't. We cherry pick the low hanging fruit first. And that's the simple graph, right? You get your gains, you go for your low cost, high return techs. High cost, low return techs give you less and less as you run, and run out of low hanging fruit, and then you tail off to nothing. Too simple. Entropy. When we're going across that graph, which was the circle and the square that I had before, the, the very simple box and circle, energy only goes one way. You can't reverse it. Right? Coal turns to ash, you can't turn ash to coal. Hot cup of coffee. Cools in a room, never heats. There's the same amount of energy in the room, but it takes more energy to put it back in than you get back. You don't do it. Things break down, never fix. Concentrate, scatter. Things are so disparate when you get to a modern cell phone that you won't apply, and we won't apply the energy to getting them back to recycle the resources. It will not happen. No. We can fool ourselves, ain't going to happen. Simple things, yes, where things are concentrated in like castings in a motor block or something. We're not going to do it with things that are that mixed up and that small like cell phones. It's not going to happen. Life trends towards death, just don't look in the mirror. Entropy is why we can tell how old each, each other are. Staving it off requires an energy input, often a resource input. Entropy is the enemy of the circular economy. Jevons paradox, otherwise known as the rebound effect, um, and, and observed what we observe with renewables is that instead of taking renewables to displace fossil fuels, we've added them to them. And that's exactly what he worked out in about 1858, that we just use more. Complexity and specialization. When things get more complex, they get harder to change. Right? There are so many little bits of it, you can't do it. Less spare capacity means we're less resilient. If we had 100 spare ICU beds in our hospitals, each hospital, we might have got away with that locking down. Right? We chose not to have the spare capacity. We didn't have the resilience. We're going to have to think about having capacity and resilience in the future. Specialists, one of the problems with specialization is that specialists know more and more about less and less until they know everything about F4. 
And the problem is, if you ask a collection of specialists like society to do something, all they can do collectively or individually is more. And yet what they're doing already is the problem. Complexity requires surplus energy, cannot be maintained without it. That's Tainter, um, a seminal book was his um, Collapse of Complex Societies in 1988. It's a must read. Sustainability, really sustainability is using renewable resources at a non-depleting rate, recycling or reusing finite resources in a non-polluting manner. That's it. In reality, it requires a huge reduction in physical consumption and pollution. But we will end up with solar energy, having used everything else by default. Our current stores of fossil fuels are too precious to burn. We should be using them, husbanding them for feedstock, for that little grandson of ours that will curse us for having burnt it. <clears throat> We no longer have the spare energy in the system to keep it going and address pollution, okay? We are now starting to triage. What that means is from here on, adaption, just adapting to what's coming, trumps mitigation, which has repercussions for the ETS and planting trees and lots of things. We need to use the present system to build the next, or at least pick the eyes out of what we think we can keep. That's the discussion we need to have about Lake Onslow. Addressing population, this is Alan Mosley Thompson, who's actually an ice core scientist, talked here years ago. Jam session afterwards, and somebody asked the Patsy question, how many people can the planet support? She replied, that's not the question. The question is, at what level of consumption do you want to live? You tell me that, I'll tell you how many. And the best estimates seem to be a good peasant level, comfortable peasant level, two billion. At our level, one billion, maybe 600 million. But of course, that's an oxymoron because by the time you're down to 600 million, you can't specialize enough to have our level. The only reason we're doing it is because we're doing resource drawdown, particularly energy resource drawdown, and it's a temporary phase. Colonialism, this gets uncomfortable. So people go down, down rabbit holes and learn languages and think they're addressing it. It's all about sunlit acreage per capita. Right? Real-time sunlit acreage per capita. This tells you that this government's attempt to pile three-story houses, three, three abreast on a postage stamp section is incorrect. It must be. There's so, got to be so little sunlight for the people in the, in the thing. And it, to counteract that, you'd have to bring energy and the results of energy into them and get their wastes away. In other words, they're wrong. So that manifestation of cramming people together high is the old thinking, it's dinosaur thinking, and they're wrong. We fudged it temporally with fossil acreage. So we got all these millions of years of solar acreage, we dug them out and we used them, but that's coming to an end. We still displace horizontally from others. We live at the expense of others. We choose not to tell them, we choose not to tell ourselves. But without oil from the Middle East, you and I wouldn't live like we do. And the Middle East was only carved up by the Brits after World War I. Those lines between Iraq and Iran didn't exist until Gertrude Bell and T.E. Lawrence and LNB and so on did their thing. They were in there so that we could get the oil from underneath them. Right? That's what we do. It, we talk about being clean and green and China having pollution, but when we buy whiteware that's built in China from a big box store, that's our pollution. Right? We offshore. And we still displace, and we don't talk about this enough, from future generations, so it's vertically. I call that longitudinal colonialism, okay? And it's why I'm here, and it's what I think of every time I look at my grandchildren. We can argue that debt, because debt is a claim on those arrows coming into that box in that first slide, 
Debt is a claim on future energy and future resources, right? And it's we're claiming it now. Thinking in systems. Population one way or another will reduce. Mother Nature has a way of only allowing those to live who can live. <clears throat> That's just how it is. It would be better that we addressed it proactively. Um, I suspect we're not going to, and I suspect we're probably overshot anyway. Physical growth will cease and reverse, slow cease and reverse. I think we're just ceasing now. I think we're going to be looking at um, existing infrastructure. We're going to be valuing it much more in the future because it's the result of expended energy and extracted materials. At the moment, we just chuck it in the landfill. I think we're going to be actually valuing it like gold. And we're going to be repurposing and re reusing what we can and fighting over it. Growth-based finance, well, it was the only thing you could construct when you were growing an economy from nothing, wasn't it? It had to be something that fitted growth. The problem now is we're going to have to be fitting degrowth, at least stagnation, and probably fitting degrowth. So the forward bets that are investments, um, Kiwi Saver, right? Pension expectations, even cash. Cash isn't wealth, it's just an expectation that sometime in the future you can swap it for energy and resources, right? All those expectations are not there in the degrowth or cannot be underwritten to the, the rate we think we were going to in the degrowth scenario. How we deal with those expectations against the reality, I have no idea whether the system collapses, whether we have debt forgiveness, huge inflation or deflation, I cannot pick that one. And conservation style environmentalism, and this is uncomfortable for some people I know in my circles who spent their lifetimes sincerely conserving. Right? It was a genuinely well needed effort, but if you ask why, the only answer to why doing conservation in the long term is to educate people enough that you don't need it in the future. Otherwise, you're just staving off. And so, yes, it was valid to do it from Rachel Carson on to now. It hasn't solved our problem. Every year since Rachel Carson, the human endeavor has got worse and more overshot and more populated. So there has to be another lever point to the human system Besides that, with all due respect to the people who've been involved in that, there has to be another legal point. Trends, my guess is. Wars over what's left. Increasingly so, I suspect. Maybe macro, maybe minor, maybe local, who knows? And over what period, I don't know. A retreat of globalism. There are arguments that globalism probably peaked with Mike Moore in the gap round in 1995, and that we've been going backwards really ever since. A reversal of rural city. What we did before fossil fuels, no city got above a million people. London was knocking on the door in 1800. What we did with fossil fuels is we went in, and in the compression, we went up. And there's an absolutely, it's logical that the center city of Auckland from a distance looks the same as the center of Sydney from a distance, right? They go up and they compress, they go up. And in New York, Trump was selling airspace above buildings. It's absolutely logical to assume that in a retreat of energy, we are going to go down and out. And maybe in a truncated time frame. So I expect more people will be involved in smaller farms producing food and that a lot of the smaller village and town type hubs that made sense before fossil fuels were applied will start to make sense again. I see the Fearless and the Geraldines and the you know, Thoma cows getting bigger again. And I see city centres imploding as per Detroit. Triage in the face of increasing decay. So this is Onslow. All right. Bardsley is an amazingly smart guy, and he did exactly the right thing going through the country and asking where we could store water at height, which is the most benign environmental battery you can have. 
On the other side of the coin, the environmentalists will line up and say that it's a terrible thing to fill an empty Lake Onslow. And they'll hammer it out. That's not the question. The question really, and when you stand back, is can we keep our grid going beyond fossil fuels? Can we service it and keep it maintained? And what are we servicing and maintaining it for? And Barnsley is still talking about things like peak demand. Will there be a peak demand when people aren't doing what they call work in cities and coming home at five o'clock, right? We have to stand back and ask a bigger picture question about Onslow, not this yin-yang one, but I'm thinking we won't get there. Physics will prevail, always does. Well-being will have to be decoupled from consumption. In this respect, the Treasury approach to looking at well-being is correct. It's not nearly far enough along the, coat, on the, the way, but we are going to have to find ways to feel happy about our lives, which don't involve massive consumption of resources and energy. There are two predictable stages. One is adequate surplus energy going into the system. Governments have st strategic control because they've got a political mandate. Down there, you've got inadequate surplus energy going into the system, collapse systems or collapsing systems, no scalable mandate. And we're seeing that with trusts, with Johnson, with Trump, right? We're starting to get Mickey Mouse and competing narratives. So this is the brigade that was sitting on the parliamentary lawn. Some of what they're saying is right and that the, the main narrative is wrong but the ones they're replacing it with aren't necessarily all correct either. So we're getting a bit messy and I'm not sure that we're going to get it back together. It's gonna to take some really, really concise, clear, simple leadership, Winston, Winston Churchill size type leadership to get this narrative correct. I don't think we're gonna get there. And we're in between these phases. What to do? Identify your best cards. You may want, not want to play it yet, you better, better identify it. Always think in energy terms. With energy, you can do anything. You can desalinate the whole ocean if you've got enough energy. You can't do diddly squat if you've got none. Energy is the key to the lock. Think laterally, inside out, back to front, upside down. Future need will be for local leadership because it's going to be much more local. I don't think we can actually keep central government as we know it going beyond fossil fuels. There's not enough surplus energy to run the surplus. We could only specialise when we had surplus energy. And some local leaders will be more gifted and talented than others, and some will get it righter than others. And so we will get communities that flourish and communities that falter. Infrastructure triage, like I said, will be valuing stuff that's built like it's gold and will be adapting like you wouldn't believe. Um, Cuba post-Russia collapse comes to mind as an example. Yeah. Information retention. Everybody thinks we've put stuff in the cloud and it's there forever. The cloud is actually 40 something percent coal-fired grid re reliant, right? We haven't come very far since Dickens. If those coal-fired grids start falling apart, so does our cloud, so is our memory of all their information but we're busy chucking books away by the thousand because we don't need them, right? Luckily, there are people who are starting to fight about this. Philip Temple, Christine, um, Dan. Um, I actually know a librarian who every library, every book that comes out that she thinks useful from the library she runs, she piles them up in their garage. I mean, we've got to think like this, right? How do we use stuff to teach people with the local leadership and the skills that we're going to have to reteach if we don't have things like books and the electronics and medias collapsing. Very few people are going this far under thought. List of books that are uh, useful to go for. If I was suggesting anything, I'd say Thinking in Systems, Donella Meadows. Um, after that, The Great Simplification, Nate Hagen's podcast series is a cracker. And after that, come see me. Um, I'll finish with, this is a thing I built my better half for 50 years ago without going off the property out of repurposed existing infrastructure. Um, 
the old man would have been pleased the BMX is upside down and back to front. Cheers. <laughs> Right. Okay, we've got about seven minutes um, before one o'clock. Um, obviously, people can stay talking with Murray after that, but I have to disappear anyway. But um, I'd just like to open it up for questions. And if anybody who's on um, online would like to pop a question in the chat, please do. Um, or otherwise, just um, yeah, you could you could unmute and, and ask your question anyway. Um, he comes with questions on. Um, so the first question, and I, maybe we start with the chat one and then we can open okay. to the audience. What role should the state take in limiting consumption? <laughs> um, what state? <laughs> um, while we have a state, it's the best thing to work with. Um, I think we're going to end up with inspired local leaders, but until we get to that stage, the state is what we have and we have to work with. Um, in terms of consumption, yes, I think they probably have a role to play in education of what I've just said. Um, it's really easy. It's not rocket science. It's pretty simple stuff to explain to people. And I think the lever, if there is one, is to explain what their grandchildren might think of them in 50 years' time for their actions now. I think if we take a long view of this, um, it might be better than just a short-term one, because the short-term one is, do I indulge myself or don't I? I might as well. But if you ask whether your grandchildren are going to thank you, maybe believe it, I don't know. That's the best one I can come up with. Right. Is it from this audience in, in the room and then, um, and then I'll go to another question and then Chandra, uh, just just one moment. Just just to the audience, somebody has uh, is unmuted and, and there's noise coming through. Um, could you just mute yourself? Thanks. So I'm going to ask you, how do we avoid that? Um, we can't do anything about the planet, I think, but. With our government intact at the moment, we can actually have a discussion about population in New Zealand, and we're overdue it. And we have to be pragmatic, and we have to start talking about immigration and who we do and don't let in, because it's Garrett Hardin's lifeboat essay from 1974 covers this one completely. You're in a lifeboat, you've got 40 of you, it can carry 50 max, and there's 500 people in the water. You can't bring the 500 people in. You're not even sure whether you want to bring 10 in in case the gales get up and you sink because you're at your max capacity, right? So pragmatically, we have to have this discussion and whether we defend ourselves or whether we don't, those things should be up for discussion. I don't worry myself about global wars because I can't do anything about them. I do wonder about invasion, either formally or informally. Yeah, and otherwise, I think we have to have a discussion about one child policies or two child policies. The option of a, a decent pandemic, not the <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last one wasn't really powerful enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that um, under quite small different condition, conditions that are a little bit of what we've just had. Yes. Uh, yes. Could easily be catastrophic. Yes, it could. Um, I, I don't really go there in my thinking, but yes, it could. Mother Nature has ways of dealing with overpopulation. I'd rather we addressed it than she did. Did you see the news that Boston University has improved the COVID virus? Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and another question from, from the chat um, from James Cohn. Um, oh, really? You've said, I don't think we're going to get there a few times, where would you point people for a general theory of where the groups of people do get there? Oh, um, uh, Cuba, uh, there's a movie called, um, it's, it's on YouTube, I think, called Cuba, um, what's called? Uh, the, the Power of Community. Thank you. The Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. Watch every part of it. Um, they're exactly where I think we're going to be. Um, 
I do think it needs leadership in Cuba had it. Um, in fact, Korea came into the same shortage at the same time as Cuba, and although they have a slight difference in um, climate, nonetheless, it was, I think, the leadership difference that made the difference largely. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd go to Great. spin off from there. Great. Um, there's another question here about um, your, your book list. Um, and obviously you've, you've put it, it's in your talk, which has been recorded, but I'm wondering, um, I'm, I'm going to suggest actually, um, if people would like the book list, can they email you? Yes, I've got a much more comprehensive book list and, and I'm happy to email it to anybody who comes in and asks. Yes. Right, right. Yes. So, so your email is, what should they, who should they ask? Um, this is, this is um, Hayden Seeger, but there might be other people oh, interested okay. as well. I, oh, I just, yeah, grimwoods at hotmail.com does it, okay. or, but otherwise um, get in touch via the centre. Great. Yeah. Okay. Got that, grimwoods at hotmail.com. Yep. I've got, there's one more question here, or is there one in the audience? Okay, let's go with this one. Uh, this is a huge one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, how would you redesign our education system that is currently set oh, up very to good. specialists? What oh, topics should very we write out? Very good. At tertiary level, they should have a meshing system so that the silos are put together at the top in a systems manner and then it devolves back down because some of what's taught here is wrong. Okay, and everybody here at tertiary level genuflects to other experts' right to have their expertise. That has to change. Um, I think obviously there'll be relevant skills and ir irrelevant skills. I think it's also important to realize that a community needs things that are not payable for, right? It shouldn't be a matter of bums on seats. It should be a matter of society actually needs this and it's useful and it's good. And I don't care that you can't get X, Y, Z dollars an hour out of it to pay your student loan back. Some things are just needed. And maybe we'll... This stuff is talking, this is decades to implement this kind of stuff, and you don't have to look very far to see how quickly things are unraveling. It's not yes. a question of decades. So have a look at the examples of where it has unraveled, like Greece, where people are paying for their dentistry with a bag of spuds, right? So why don't you pay for education the same way? Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, I just think we have to adapt to working out what is useful in the future and what isn't. And I think that's going to change away from things like commerce and finance and more into practical hands-on stuff. Great. Well, that's not, I'll, I'll leave you guys to talk at the moment, but I think we need to close this off because we're, we're up to our hour. Um, so, yeah, I'd like just to thank everybody very much uh, for coming along. We've got a great audience of around 52 people um, online, which is fantastic. And also this has been recorded. Um, so thank you, Murray, for a very stimulating talk. And there's a lot of um, compliments that are coming through on the on the chat as well. Um, if people would like to stay chatting, you're most welcome. But I think that the, the Zoom um, recording will go off now. Um, but I'll just, I have to leave the room, but I'll leave this going. And if people want to continue in person chat or online chat with Murray, please keep, keep it up. So thank you very much. <laughs>